Hey guys, Brian Schultz here with Cape Falcon Kayak, and welcome to the fourth video in our free Greenland paddle building series. In this video, we're gonna be talking about selecting tools and setting up your workspace. Now, remember, this is a series, so if you haven't done this already, make sure that you go back and at least watch the introduction video. I'll throw a link up on the screen for that right now, and you can find the entire playlist with all these videos in order here on the channel. You can also find this entire series for free without any commercials on my website, and then as always, if you wanna support the free content that we put out here, think about picking up a set of our paddle plans, checking out our skin on frame boat building courses, buying your next piece of paddling gear from us, or just making a donation. You can find all that stuff on our website and there are links in the video description below. And of course, if you have any thoughts or any questions, make sure you leave them in the comments. All right, enjoy the video. So in this video, I'm gonna show you all the tools you're gonna to need to carve a Greenland paddle using our system. Now, keep in mind, this is not the only way you can build a Greenland paddle. If you want to, you could use even more specialized woodworking equipment than we have here, and that may make some parts of the process slightly easier. On the other hand, you could do this with even less tools, and it's just gonna be a lot more work, and it's gonna take a lot longer. So, basically, when I'm designing toolkits for people, I try to strike a balance between cost and simplicity and overall efficiency of the process. So the toolkit that I put together here is not just a toolkit for building Greenland paddles, it's a really good basic woodworking toolkit that gives you all the introductory things you're gonna to need to do a variety of other projects, including building one of my skin on frame kayaks or one of my skin on frame canoes. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna bring you in, I'm gonna show you each tool, I'm gonna to talk about what I use it for, and if there's situations where a different tool could be substituted if you don't have something or you don't wanna pay for it, I'm gonna talk about that as well, and I'll tell you the advantages and the disadvantages of that approach. So starting out with the hand tools, the foundation of this system is a fine point Sharpie, and we're gonna use this to make most of the layout marks along the paddle. And the reason I prefer a Sharpie as opposed to a pencil is because the line is a lot darker, so it's a lot easier to see what you're doing. And also because the line has thickness, that means that you can see if you're cutting into it a little bit, which is way different than a pencil, which is kind of a all or nothing affair. And if you cut a little bit into a pencil line, you no longer have a line and you can't see what you're doing and so I would strongly encourage you to follow my advice and use the sharpie when I say to use the sharpie for the layout on this process and then there's a couple times that I'm gonna have you use a pencil now also we've got a tape measure just for measuring things out we've got a combination square for making different square marks at different points in the process and something that's not absolutely mandatory but is really nice to have is a dial caliper and these days, it doesn't make sense to spend a huge amount of money on a dial caliper because honestly, most of the $100 plus dial calipers out there are worse quality than something that you can get a lot cheaper. So currently, my favorite dial caliper is this Shop Fox dial caliper. It costs about $40 on Amazon, and this seems to be fairly durable and reasonable quality for the price. So just really quick here, if you don't feel like buying a dial caliper, you can improvise one with your combination square. So if you decide to go this route, what you're gonna do is set your square to the nearest even number, and then you're gonna grab any old scrap of wood that you can clamp onto the leg here and clamp it on with any clamp that you have. And then to use this as a caliper, all you've gotta do is just move the body of the square back and forth on the leg, and you can use that to measure the thickness. Now, this is actually kind of annoying to use in real life, but it is a way to do this if you don't feel like buying a caliper. Now, one more tool that isn't mandatory, but it's nice to have is a profile gauge. And what this is, is just a bunch of little parallel fingers that can slide up and down, and it can let you check the shaping of complex objects. And this is something that's commonly used in finished carpentry when people are trying to fit things together, but it's also really useful for paddle building because once you get to the end of the shaping process, sometimes it's a little difficult to see exactly what you're doing, and being able to take a profile gauge like this and just push it over your paddle lets you actually see the shape that you've created. And if you wanna transfer this onto a piece of paper, all you have to do is lay the profile gauge down, trace this with a pencil, and then you can actually check your blade shaping against what we recommend in the paddle plans. So this isn't necessary, but if you're really serious about trying to get the most performance out of your paddle as possible, I would recommend checking out the paddle plans, getting yourself a profile gauge, and then at the very end of the blade carving process, you can check all your shapes to see if they match our recommendations. 
Now, next up, I've got a couple of engagement clamps here just to clamp the paddle down to my workbench. You don't have to use exactly this style of clamp. I just find that these ones are really convenient to use. This is the 8-inch Irwin Quick Grip Clamp. Now, moving on to actual carving tools, you're going to need a chisel of some sort. I'm going to use a 1-inch chisel for this. And for the amount of work that you do on a Greenland paddle or even on a skin-on-frame kayak, any one inch chisel is going to be just fine. You can literally buy the cheapest one inch chisel at the hardware store if you want to. We're only going to use it a couple of times. You just have to make sure that you sharpen it. Now, for the Japanese saw, which we're going to use to make not that many, but a couple cuts on the paddle, I would recommend just scrolling forward in the video course to see where we're actually using this. And then if you don't feel like purchasing a nice Japanese saw, you can probably get away with just about any saw that you have laying around your workshop. But if you're going to be doing a lot of fine woodworking, and especially if you're going to be building one of my skin-on-frame kayaks or canoes, I would highly recommend purchasing exactly this saw right here because this thing works really, really well for all of these tasks, including what we need to do on the Greenland paddle. And I'll make sure that I put the exact model number for this in the Greenland paddle plans. Now, Moving on to the block planes, block planes are kind of a frustrating subject for me right now because there really hasn't been very many good ones made in the last 20 years. And so for me personally, my favorite two block planes are this older record 60 and a half block plane or this older Stanley 60 and a half block plane. Both of these are excellent quality block planes. This one's a little bit wider, so it works better if you have bigger hands. This one's a little bit narrower, so it's better for smaller hands. Now, unfortunately, neither of these are produced anymore. There was a period of time in the early 2000s where the successor for this plane was made in England, and it was also a pretty darn good block plane, but then it was manufactured somewhere else, and the quality has deteriorated so much that I can't recommend the Stanley low-angle contractor-grade block plane anymore because the castings have gotten so bad on it that it's almost impossible to make it work right. So I've been doing a lot of searching lately, trying to find a suitable substitution. And the best one that I have found is this Calistrano low angle block plane, which looks superficially similar to one of these, but it's definitely heavier. I don't like the ergonomics as well, and it's a little bit crudely made. And so if you get one of these, you're gonna have to put a bit of work into it to get everything functioning right. But if you follow the instructions in my block plane and sharpening video, you should be able to get one of these running pretty well to carve your Greenland paddle. Nice thing about this is that it's only about $30 on the internet. Now, moving up from there into more expensive block planes, I really don't have a recommendation. You can spend up to $250 on a block plane, but I haven't found anything that personally I really like using enough to justify the extra expense. So if you can find an older Stanley 60 and a half or a record 60 and a half block plane that's in good condition on the internet, I would recommend just buying one of these, make sure you get good pictures of it first so it doesn't have any damage, and then you can clean it up and you're gonna have an amazing quality block plane for the rest of your life. Now, in addition to a plane and a chisel, obviously you're gonna need some way to sharpen these because block planes do not come sharp even if they're brand new. And so that means that you're gonna need some type of sharpening stone and you're also gonna need a honing guide. Now, the honing guide here is really cheap. You can get these for 10 bucks off the internet. They're all pretty much identical. The stones really depends on how much money you wanna put into it, which depends on how much woodworking you're gonna be doing. Now, if you're just gonna be doing a couple projects, let's say you're gonna make a couple Greenland paddles in one of my skin-on-frame kayaks, I would recommend getting the Norton 1000-4000 stone because that's a combination stone that'll do everything you need to do. My only complaint about that particular stone is that because it's a little bit soft, it tends to wear down pretty quickly and you have to flatten it a lot more often. So if you think you're gonna be doing a significant amount of woodworking, you might wanna jump up to getting a set of Shapton stones. This is a 1,000 grit, this is a 6,000 grit, and based on my experience, you probably also wanna purchase a 2,000 grit as well. So that's definitely a more complicated and much more expensive sharpening system, but in the long run, if you're gonna be doing woodworking for years and years and years, this is gonna be a higher value than the Norton Stone. Now, before we get into the power tools, I just wanna make it really clear that even though I am gonna be showing you different power tool techniques in this video, this course is not designed to teach you how to use power tools safely. It is your responsibility to make sure that you have the proper safety training to be able to use any of the tools we show in this video. And if you don't have that training, please get that before you start carving your paddle. 
So first up here, you're gonna need some way to cut out the paddle shape, and my preference for that would be a medium to high powered bandsaw with a brand new half inch wide four tooth blade. And the reason I specified this specific blade is because it's aggressive enough that it can make the taller cuts for the paddle tapers without wandering, but it's also narrow enough that it's really easy to steer and you can follow a line really accurately. And you always want to get a brand new blade anytime you're starting a project like this because these are only about $13 and if you make a mistake, you're going to destroy a much more expensive piece of wood. Now, when I say medium to high powered, I'm talking about a bandsaw that is at least three quarter horsepower. Any less than that, and you're just not gonna have enough power to turn this blade, and the blade is gonna start to wander in the cut, and you're gonna have pretty bad results. So if you don't have a higher powered bandsaw or you don't have access to one, your other option would be to use a really good high powered jigsaw. So basically, if you're gonna use a jigsaw for this, you're gonna to need to get a higher end model from a reputable brand. And what you wanna look for is to make sure that it has an orbital adjustment, which is this lever on the side, because that actually kicks the blade forward as it's cutting, and it makes it a lot easier to cut. Now, additionally, I also have a blade recommendation for this, which you can find in the paddle plans. And personally, I'm a big fan of barrel grip jigsaws because unlike a handle grip jigsaw where your hand is much farther away from the work and your forearm is tense, a barrel grip jigsaw allows you to turn the thing on and leave it on and put your hand loosely on the tool, which results in a lot better control and a lot more accurate cut. So if you're gonna use a jigsaw, it's gotta be a good one. Now, one last thing I want to mention about the bandsaw is that if you're using a bandsaw for this and you're new to bandsaws, you're going to have to take the time to learn how to tune it correctly because a poorly tuned bandsaw is going to do poor quality work. Now, moving on to the handheld power planer, we use this for carving away a lot of the material before we get in and do the fine planing with the hand planer. And I know some paddle builders just start by taking away large amounts of material with a block plane, but I'm personally not a big fan of that approach because it's the wrong tool for the job and you just end up exhausting yourself. And then by the time you get to the fine work, you don't have the energy or the focus left to do it. So if we use the power planer to carve away most of the material, then we get down to where it actually matters. We can get in there with a block plane and we can do a much nicer job. Now, my personal favorite plane for this is the Bosch 3365 Power Planer. This is not a power planer that's made anymore, but you can often find these on eBay. And the reason I like this specific planer is because it was fairly well made, at least at that time. And also it's nice and light, which makes it really easy to carve with freehand. And unfortunately, the newer generation of power planers, except for a couple of them, have got much bulkier and much heavier, which makes them a lot harder to control when you're doing freehand hand carving like you're going to see in these videos. And so if you have to buy a brand new power planer, I think your best choice for a Greenland paddle right now is the Ryobi planer. Obviously that's not the highest quality planer, but it is inexpensive and it's nice because it's light, which makes it easier to do this kind of work. If you don't want to get that, you can look into this specific planer. Once again, this is the Bosch 3365. You can find these a lot on eBay. Now, before I forget here, there's one more really important thing you need to know about this tool. And that is, when you buy these from the store, normally they have a little lever on the back here that is meant to flip down. And what that's for is it's a safety mechanism. So if you set your planer down on your workbench while it's still running, it doesn't cut into your workbench or potentially snap the belt inside of the planer. But that's actually kind of a problem for the type of work that we're going to be doing because we're going to be cutting across an edge. And whenever you do that, it's going to grab that little thing and it's going to stop the planer. So if you're going to do this type of carving with a power planer, you're going to have to remove that safety feature either by taping it out of the way, taking the planer apart, or my favorite, breaking it off with a hammer. Just keep in mind that once that little lever is gone, you're going to have to make sure that you don't set this down on your workbench while it's still running. Now, if you don't want to purchase or you don't want to use a power planer for some reason, there are other options. You could potentially just use your block plane to do all the work that you would do with the power planer, but as you're going to see in the upcoming videos, that's going to be quite a bit of work. Now, another more traditional option for this 
is to use a draw knife. And this is a bit of a specialized tool, so I would not recommend trying to learn to use a draw knife on a Greenland paddle. If you're interested in draw knife technique, there's a lot of great videos for it on the internet. And you're also gonna have to build kind of a specialized workstation called a shaving horse to really get the most out of this tool. For me personally, I just use the power planer because it's a lot faster and it's a lot easier. Now, one final power tool that is optional, but is really nice to have if you have the skills to use it, is a router with a half inch collet. So this is gonna be a fairly high powered router because we're gonna be using it to drive a half inch roundover bit, which we're gonna to use to round over the loom. Now, this is not the only way that you can do this. You can use your chisel, your Japanese saw, and your block plane to get exactly the same results. The only difference with the router is that it takes about a minute to do the entire task. And if you're doing it with hand tools, it's gonna to take you about 30 minutes. So if you wanna decide whether it makes sense to invest in something like this, you can just skip ahead to the video where I show you how to round over the loom. You can look at the two different methods and you can make a decision just based on what makes sense for you. Couple more things to mention here. You're gonna need some sort of a straight edge. It doesn't have to be an aluminum straight edge, but it does have to actually be straight. You can just use a piece of wood for this as long as you're sure it's perfectly straight. Also, you always wanna have the proper safety equipment anytime you're working with power tools. So that means ear protection, eye protection, and respiratory protection. And then finally, believe it or not, you're only gonna need two pieces of sandpaper for this entire project. You're gonna need one piece of 120 or 150 grit sandpaper and one piece of 220 grit sandpaper. And I know it's a little bit ridiculous to specify a sanding block, and I wouldn't expect you to go buy something like this if you don't have it already, but if you have a piece of mini cell foam that's about an inch and a quarter thick by two and three quarter inches wide by five and a half inches long, this fits perfectly on top of one of these pieces of sandpaper. And the nice thing about it is because it's a little bit flexible, it really helps to sand those shapes nice and easily without creating any flat spots. Now, if you order a kayak building kit from us, we actually send you the foam thigh braces for the cockpit and the offcut from these. And you can just take this offcut and cut it with a Japanese saw at two and three quarter, and that's gonna give you this sanding block automatically. So last thing I wanna talk about is setting up your workstation because your workbench has a huge impact on how easy this is to do and also how well it turns out. And so the ideal situation here would be a super heavy dedicated workbench with clamps already built into it about three inches below the height of your belly button. But most people aren't just gonna have that in their garage. So there's a way that you can improvise something that's gonna work almost as well. And the nice thing about this is that if you're not using it, you can set it out of the way and it's not gonna take up any space. And this is something I've been doing in my own workshops for over 20 years. I know that it looks kind of barbaric, but it's inexpensive, it's easy to build, and it's super useful for building Greenland paddles and also for different projects we do on Skin On Frame kayaks. So you can see here, I've just got this sheet of plywood. This is a half sheet of plywood. If you buy a whole sheet of plywood and cut it down the middle, you can make two of these workbenches, which is really helpful for doing layout on longer kayak and canoe pieces. And then I've got it sitting on top of some sawhorses, but it's not just sitting on the sawhorses. I've reinforced it with two construction grade two by fours or two by sixes that are screwed to the bottom of this. Now, specifically, this is birch ply, but you could use any other high grade plywood that has a lot of layers. I wouldn't spring for this super expensive birch ply. I feel like the shop grade is just fine. You just wanna stay away from the lower grade plywood that has fewer layers and rough surfaces, and especially you don't wanna use OSB or MDF for this. Now, the two by four or the two by six down here, I just screw straight through the top of the bench with some sheetrock screws every eight to 10 inches or so. And when you put this on, you wanna make sure that you put this two inches away from the edge on the side and also on the ends as well. Now, as far as the sawhorses it's sitting on, you're probably just gonna use what you have around or you're gonna build something, but you wanna make sure that whatever it is, it is really stout because if it's an older sawhorse or it's a cheap plastic sawhorse and it kind of wobbles back and forth, you're gonna have a lot of problems carving your paddle. And if you're setting up a shop and you're thinking you're really gonna get into woodworking or building things, I would highly recommend investing in these specific sawhorses. These are Trojan folding metal sawhorses. They pack down to almost nothing, but they are super duper strong and stiff. 
Basically, they squeeze onto a two by four or any other piece of lumber that's an inch and a half wide, which means that if you wanna raise your bench height, all you have to do is put this on a two by six or a two by eight instead of a two by four. And also, if you want wider sawhorses for a specific project, you can just cut a longer two by four and then put these anywhere along here. These are super expensive, but they're also amazing quality. I can't recommend them enough.